the end of the day, uh, I have to get through those things in order to continue doing my hobby for a living. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very worthwhile pursuit. I think. Welcome to Stout Conversations, where every week we sit down with creative thinkers in the craft beer industry and beyond. Your hosts, Ken and April, live and work in a 24-foot RV, traveling the country in search of great stories around a great beer. Dreams can materialize from anywhere, and for Ryan from Devil's Head Distillery in Inglewood, Colorado, his started on top of a mountain, Devil's Head Mountain, where the juniper berries planted an idea years in the making. Ditching the corporate world and changing suburban laws, the dream of juniper to gin became the reality of Devil's Head Distillery. Sweet, we're at Devil's Head Distillery. Devil's Head, Ryan, so where'd you come up with the idea for Devil's Head, the name Devil's Head? Where's this whole thing come from? So it was first conceived uh, while climbing Devil's Head Mountain, which is uh, uh, about an hour south southwest of here. Um, uh, near Castle Rock, which is where I grew up and went to high school and whatnot. Um, so I used to uh, do that hike quite a bit as a kid and growing up. Um, and I was hiking it with a buddy of mine about, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years ago. And I was a big gin drinker at the time. And there was a lot of juniper bushes along the trail to the top. And I said uh, to my buddy, I said, let's harvest these, make gin, um, and get rich. And, uh, in our early 20s, very early 20s, and spent probably an hour looking into it and just all the bureaucratic red tape and permits and all that kind of stuff, compliance and regulate, re regulatory stuff, um, was pretty daunting, as was the cost of all the equipment. There was just a lot of barriers to entry. And how many juniper berries does it take to get rich? Right, yeah. So, so you're going to walk along the trail, picking these juniper berries and carry them all back and get rich. Right. It's, yeah. like, it's like money grows on trees. It probably takes a little more than it thinks. Ignorance is bliss, as they say. So, um, um, but it sparked a great idea. Right? Yeah, so so I spent probably an hour looking into it and then shelved the idea. And uh, after getting burnt out in the corporate world, um, about eight years ago, decided to get uh, more serious about it. So, um, and, you know, older and hopefully a little bit wiser, um, came at it with a, a, a different approach than I did or originally. And uh, so it took four years to get the doors open, and we just had our four-year anniversary in uh, September. Nice, wow. congratulations. So, yeah. And that is here in Inglewood, Colorado is where we're at, for people Correct. that don't know where Devil's Head is, or Correct. Inglewood. So how did you make the jump from growing up in Castle Rock to opening in Inglewood? In Inglewood? Why, so, why did you choose Inglewood? So, good question. So for, for a number of reasons, actually. So I was born at Swedish Hospital here in Inglewood. Just down um, the road from here? Just down the road. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Uh, and uh, grew up in Littleton, actually. Even when, the, when I went to school in Castle Rock, I was uh, in Littleton. And so I knew I wanted to open up either in Inglewood or Littleton. Denver already had a number of distilleries in it, and so I didn't really want to enter a, a, a market that was already somewhat saturated. And uh, neither Littleton nor Inglewood had a distillery. So uh, the first thing I did was reach out to both of, the, of those municipalities and find out what the ordinances were, or the regulations in terms of uh, the law of the distillery. And both of them had uh, antiquated laws that strictly prohibited distilleries. So um, the two places you wanted to open a distillery, it was illegal? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so went about it by uh, attending uh, city council meetings and planning and zoning meetings and waiting for an opportunity to get up and speak and uh, express my interest <laughs> and, and what I wanted to do and try to get their uh, blessing on it. And all in all, that took uh, just shy of a year and a half in, uh, in both municipalities, and I succeeded in both municipalities and got the law uh, revised and changed to where uh, distilleries can now operate in both cities. But it was really what it came down to uh, was just the direction that Inglewood uh, has been taking. I feel like they're more receptive to smaller businesses um, as opposed to the more corporate or chain type places, um, which I feel like is. Uh, more community oriented when they're when they're more receptive to kind of hot type places and like I said less of a corporate. So um, even though you eventually chose Inglewood, did you also does that mean now that Littleton is also opened up for a distillery yeah. because of your efforts? Yeah, and there's actually there's a couple distilleries in Littleton. Which okay. is great, which is, um, I, I welcome all and of And they that. pay you a commission. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's such a small and burgeoning industry that we're all, it's very amicable, everybody, and, you know, rising tides raise all ships kind of thing. So it, I think that it's great. the more the merrier. Unfortunately, there's not any, any more in Inglewood yet, which I think that um, if there were, it would be a great thing 
for us too right. to have that, uh, you know, just to be more of a destination for people to enjoy those. Is sort of the things. craft distilling side of things like in craft the craft beer world? You know, a lot of uh, brewers and such question. are friends, yeah, exactly. or, and like or, like, or at least they're very friendly and towards each other. Even yeah. though there's competition, obviously for business there's still a community built around helping each other out and not Absolutely. really like yeah. undercutting each other and right. things like that. Do you see that the same way in distilling? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, it's, it's a very friendly industry, which is one of the greatest things about it, I think. It's, it's not something where it's very cutthroat and everybody's uh, viciously fighting each other for shelf space at liquor stores, bars, and restaurants and whatnot. So it is, unfortunately, I don't have the time being a one-man operation with the production and whatnot to go out and um, really nurture relationships with the other folks because I'm busy doing my thing here and they're more than likely busy doing their thing at their facilities as well. But, yeah. <laughs> but it is, um, when, we, when we encounter each other at different spirits, festivals, and tasting events and things like that, there's a lot of camaraderie and, and support for one another, for sure. Is, um, I was just going to say, like, is your one man, like, you do a lot, like, all this work basically yourself. You have a couple of bartenders, but it's your your baby basically Correct, is that yeah. out of like necessity or more like it's just what you want to do and you like that kind of ownership well, of it well the production you. side of it is not something that I want to give up um, which is unfortunately in a lot of instances that's uh, the first thing that people do give up um, in this industry and that's the one thing I'm fighting tooth and nail to not give up because that's the, the, the part of it that brought me into okay. it, the part that I enjoy the part that I am the most, the most passionate about um, is that production is part of it and, and product development, recipe development, things like that. What is that, like the, art, the artistry of it? Is that, that and what? the science, both and of those, the and, the, and the coming together of those two things. It's kind of an interesting uh, thing in that regard where um, there is so much of it that is governed by science um, and the laws of physics and distillation and whatnot. Um, but then you also have the artistry, and if there weren't that part of it, then there would be no distinctions between the different uh, spirits on the shelf at a liquor store. They would all be the same. And it's that artistry that uh, opens it up to have so many different and unique spirits available, if that makes sense. Well, right, and you do have a fairly unique spirit here. Like, you have vodka and you have gin, which most people are, in America are fairly, um, fairly comfortable with or are aware of, but Aquavit. Aquavit is something that I know for me when I first encountered it was here at Devil's Head. Like, does that take another level of artistry that enticed you to um, do this? Because kind of, you, you like the science of it, but that, that could be, that's something to me that smacks of a whole, a, an artistry level because it sets itself apart from these other spirits that are commonly known. Yeah, I think that um, it's not really any different in gin in terms of the way that the, the creativity is applied to developing a recipe. Um, but the, the one thing that drew me to doing an aqua beat was is, is, is its obscurity in the U.S. and something that had such a rich cultural heritage in Northern Europe, but relatively unknown over here. And so I saw an opportunity with that. Um, as a very small producer, we're much more of a boutique distillery where it's more about quality than it is about volume. Um, and so looking for ways to distinguish ourselves and stand out amongst you know, what's becoming every day more and more of the field in terms of, uh, especially in Colorado. Colorado is a great place for all uh, uh, beer, spirits, and Right. Or in all things craft and creative. Right. And so um, the Aqua Beat was really um, uh, a decision based more around that, just kind of giving us something to set ourselves apart. Um, and then it grew into something else. Um, initially, I had intend intended to do a whiskey, but that's a very saturated market in Colorado. There's a lot of brands, um, and we're so small um, that it would be hard to stand out amongst all of the, those different brands. So. At that point, I decided to put the aqua beat into a barrel to see what would happen. Um, in order to have something that was similar to whiskey, but not a whiskey. And so that's how the, the uh, Oak Barrel Reserve aqua beat came to be. Do you have um, both of those? Yeah. Because you have two of them, right? So, right? so this is... That's the traditional clear, and then this is the barrel. Okay. Yeah. So a traditional aqua beat, you wouldn't barrel it? You wouldn't put it in a barrel? There are some. You would normally just bottle it? There are some that are aged for a short duration. Uh, but not for not for a long duration. So um, it's good. Mm -hmm. It's really good. our oak barrel reserve aqua beat uh, spends a minimum of two years in a brand new American white oak barrel, the char number three. So it's a very standard whiskey barrel. 
um, and it produces a product of spirit that's uh, very reminiscent of a whiskey, but you have the added complexity of the botanicals as well. So. And that was just, uh, you wanted to try it and see what happened? Yeah. And it, how, did you, how did you feel it happened? Um, it happened really well. well. Yeah, we, we took home the gold medal at the Berlin International Spirits Competition with it last year, as well as the Beer Distillery of the Year. And it's got us uh, a lot of uh, publicity in various publications. And uh, uh, most recently, earlier in the year, in Popper Mechanics Magazine, we did a write up on, on the Oak on Barrel Reserve Auction, actually. Back when they, we were the second to last booze call in that we had in that magazine. Well, it's nice. It has kind of a. I think I get a little bit of like a licorice type undertone yeah, to it. Yeah. Not, not an in-your-face thing like a Jaeger or something. No. Right. Like just a nice subtle thing that yeah, blends yeah. with a lot of floral type flavors. Yeah. The anise and the fennel will both kind of impart uh, that that black licorice flavor. And then the barrel, the oak barrel one though, that adds like another complexity to it and almost gives a hint of a cinnamony kind of running through it or something. In my I don't That's know. I, well, I don't have like any uh, kind of expertise in tasting any of these, but this has almost like a, like a, like a sweeter kind of taste than the barrel one does. I don't know. There's just that, that's just the language that comes to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> the the oak barrel reserve I pick up um, mm. a, a lot of earthy notes, um, yeah. almost leathery yeah. even. Um, and then with the with the with the clear rock of each, um, it's interesting to hear different people's perspectives on it because we get a lot of feedback that they pick up that anise um, first and foremost. Um, whereas I definitely don't. I pick it up in there, but it's a lot more subtle and more in the background to me than the um, than the caraway. But um, every palate is different. It's a very subjective thing. And so how do you break that down when you say you're making a gin or a vodka, which is a much more common drink here? How do you like distinguish yourself, your gin, from somebody else's gin across town or across the country? So I spent uh, about two years distilling botanicals uh, on a benchtop still uh, in, in various amounts, and, and, and I think I did 72 different botanicals. Um, rather than just shooting from the hip and throwing a bunch of things together and um, hoping for the best uh, in the outcome, um, and just you know, continually doing that until I found something that I wanted to move forward with. I thought that, that just some individual botanicals uh, independently of one another and learning how they impart flavor would be a much better approach um, to doing that. So the gin, our, the, the, our flagship gin, is a new American style, um, which means that it's less, uh, uh, less emphasis on the juniper than traditional uh, gins like Eco or Tangeray or something like that. Um, we have, a, we have a lot of different botanicals in there that uh, are kind of raised uh, up, not to where they're over, overtaking the juniper, but they're uh, rounding it out more so. So uh, rose petal, lavender, chamomile, uh, among other botanicals in addition to the juniper, um, is what, uh, what, what my gin is comprised of. And so um, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing gin. Uh, I wanted to do one that would be a more approachable, like the American style one that would be more approachable for non gin drinkers. Um, gin is such a divisive spirit, people either, either usually love it or they hate it. So. You gotta find the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, there's, and it's out there. Absolutely. It takes me about a month to do a batch of any one of the spirits on here um, with the barrel aged to fill a barrel. Um, it still takes me about a month. Whereas a lot of the big producers can turn out a barrel every uh, um, like 30 seconds, like a 53 gallon barrel every 30 seconds. And so they probably lose more <laughs> in waste down the drain on a daily basis than I'm able to produce in a month. And so, but that's the difference between uh, um, craft and not craft, you know, and, and beer or wine production. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I have to kind of say though, going back to the gin, and you're talking about those floral characteristics, you can really taste those characteristics in there and it's really smooth and it has a great flavor to it. Like I think I would pick this actually over the other ones just because, and it surprises me because yeah. gin, it's not your, I'm part of one of those high school stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a beautiful flavor. Yeah, thank you. Gin yeah. didn't usually end well in high school. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, four years in, what would you say is probably your biggest challenge? Or does that change every day? It changes every day, yeah. The, 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 like the today biggest, compared to... Right, the biggest challenge is the one that I'm facing on that particular day, I feel like. But, um, you know, uh, 
gosh, I don't know. There's there's so many, but it, it's also rewarding at the same time. So that's the thing that it, you know, keeping that perspective um, when 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 things can be trying or when you're having an issue with the hot water heaters or the steam boiler or things like that. Um, it can be trying, but at the end of the day, uh, I have to get through those things in order to continue doing my hobby for a living. So it's a, you know it's a it's a very worthwhile pursuit. I think. Do, do, um, do you ever miss the corporate world face not versus at all. this? No, <laughs> it makes me cringe to even think about uh, uh, really. But um, it's a lot. This is a lot of work. Uh, I miss having a life outside of this place sometimes. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, I, I, I would much rather be doing this than making somebody else's dream yeah. in the corporate world come true. So. I hear that so often and it's so inspiring yeah. all the time. Yeah. Well, and I think on that note, yeah. since we've got you kind of introspective here, <laughs> we go by living a stout life. And for us, that's kind of a double-edged meaning of like, yeah, it's all, it's about good craft beer and now craft spirits. I'm really really enjoying He's diving hard and fast into this. Uh, I'm diving very hard and fast into it. But it's also about um, life and how you live your life. So for you, Ryan, what is your ideal living a style life? Uh, For me, it's uh, quality uh, over quantity, I guess. Uh, Life, I look at very in in very similar terms to the spirits that I produce. Um, And just being able to have happiness and peace of mind at the end of the day and enjoy what you're doing and feel good about what you're doing. And for me, um, I've been able to find that in Devil's Head Distillery, so, uh, which is definitely not something that uh, uh, I could have claimed when I was working in the corporate world for 20 years. Awesome. You should grab one just to do a cheers. You want to drink one or whatever you like. I'll I'm going with the other. Like, cheers to the devil. <laughs> cheers to the devil's head. <laughs> cheers. We have new conversations every week. Be sure to subscribe to Living a Stout Life so you don't miss out. Overcoming challenges is a part of realizing dreams. Ryan mentions keeping perspective when he has to deal with challenges. How do you handle them? Inspire us in the comments below.